Thank you for joining today's discussion on the 2018 Farm Bill and its conservation title. Our panelists are Lori Restino, a visiting scholar at the George Washington University School of Law and member scholar at the Center for Progressive Reform. Ferd Hefner, the Senior Strategic Advisor to the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Caroline Kitchens, the Federal Affairs Manager at R Street Institute and Alex Murdoch, the Vice President of Policy at American Forests. Lori, I'll turn it over to you and the rest of today's panelists. Thanks so much, Brian. I appreciate it. So why are we talking about the conservation title and the Farm Bill in general today? Because the Farm Bill is our largest investment in private working lands conservation, and these lands make up the majority of the land mass of the lower 48 states. Consequently, the environmental health of working lands is critical to the overall environmental health of America. Unfortunately, as you all know, the 2014 Farm Bill expired without a new Farm Bill being passed. So today, we are going to discuss why the negotiations between the House and the Senate have failed to produce a compromised piece of legislation, what the major differences are between the House and the Senate version, and importantly, how the midterms have impacted the outlook for the 2018 Farm Bill, if at all. So with that intro aside, I wanted to start uh, the questions off, to, off today with, um, with Ferd. Ferd, can you start us off by summarizing the major differences in the conservation title between the House and Senate versions? And then could you also just give us a brief overview of important conservation provisions in the other parts of the Farm Bill? Yeah, sure, Larry, and happy to do that and happy to be here. So let's start with funding. There's, you know, policy and funding. We'll start with funding. The last Farm Bill, 2014, to put it in context, uh, cut conservation funding by about $6 billion, uh, with the largest of those cuts aimed at both land retirement programs and working lands conservation. The 2014 Farm Bill also combined several easement programs into one larger umbrella program, but reduced funding for easements uh, in half compared to historic levels. So both the pending House and, and Senate bills would uh, bring those easement programs back up closer to the historic levels, uh, but they do so by making further reductions in working lands conservation programs. So, in other words, rather than rectify the mistake made in the last Farm Bill by restoring some or all of those missing funds, both bills uh, pending now would add insult to injury by making amends to one type of program, the easement programs, by cutting further another type of programs, the working lands programs. In that sense, neither bill does the right thing by conservation, which would have been to restore the cuts. That said, there is nonetheless a stark difference between the two bills. The Senate bill takes just the amount of money needed to restore the easement cut from the working lands programs, no more, no less, roughly $2.5 billion. And it leaves both of the two big working lands programs intact, strengthening them around the edges in terms of policy. The House bill, by sharp contrast, reduces the working lands programs by $5 billion and completely eliminates the largest working land program, the one with the most environmental impact, the Conservation Stewardship Program. We'll no doubt get to that later in the webinar, but this is the single biggest conservation issue holding up the conference committee at this point. The House bill also reduces total conservation title funding by a billion dollars and transfers that money to other titles of the bill, whereas the Senate keeps funding constant um, compared to current law. Within the Senate bill's conservation stewardship program section, there are new provisions to provide additional support for cover crops, diversified crop rotations, uh, management intensive rotational grazing, and comprehensive conservation planning. Of course, none of those are in the House bill because the House bill eliminates the program. Um, within the easement program, the agricultural conservation easement program, uh, the, the two bills are similar. They differ in some small ways, but not in overarching ways. And, we could get into some of those, but I won't detail them here. The Regional Conservation Partnership Program, the program that uh, targets money to specific local issues through a partnership approach, is also quite similar in both bills. 
two big differences. One is the funding mechanism. The Senate is much closer to current law, taking a set aside from each of the underlying Farm Bill conservation programs to fund RCPP, whereas the House bill eliminates the set aside and creates a RCPP only funding stream. And uh, secondly, the Senate bill would create a new grant program within RCPP that would turn over administration of conservation programs to partner organizations rather than being run by USDA. The Big Land Retirement Program Conservation Reserve Program also has commonalities and differences. Uh, the commonality is both bills are premised on the idea that cuts to CRP rental payments need to be made in order to free up funding to enroll additional CRP acres, but now at this new discounted rate. Um, however, relative to the Senate bill, the House bill discounts that rental rate by a much greater factor to raise the CRP acreage cap by even more than the Senate bill does. So both bills, in a way, are taking a gamble that despite these below market rental rates, landowners will still be interested in renting their land to the government in 10-year increments. Uh, one effect of that one-size-fits-all approach to rental rate reductions is that the, the environmental benefits gained by each new enrollment acre will almost certainly go down, and the cost-benefit uh, will be much lower than the existing program. But they evidently are willing to take that gamble just in order to create uh, to increase total CRP acreage. The Senate bill within CRP also uh, creates a variety of much-needed improvements to the continuous CRP program. That's the partial field enrollments of targeted conservation practices that are really aimed at water quality and threatened and endangered species habitat. And those uh, CCRP improvements are in the Senate bill but not in the House bill, so that's another issue that they're trying to negotiate and settle in the conference agreement. Um, the House bill does contain one very important provision that's not in the Senate bill, and this would direct USDA on a regular basis to collect and analyze information to provide assessments of the effectiveness of conservation programs in solving our major agro-environmental challenges. This is a long overdue provision that would help farmers determine their most cost-effective strategies, would help future Congresses determine what funding and policy choices to make, and uh, obviously would ultimately improve the environmental performance of the taxpayer's major investment in farm bill conservation programs. So just a quick word about some conservation things in other titles of the farm bill, not the conservation title. In Title I, the commodity programs, the big issue that uh, remains, well, they, they, it sounds like they're getting close to resolving, but uh, was unresolved for a long while, is um, that those commodity base acres that are in the commodity programs but are planted to grass either because of the farmer's environmental concern about those acres or because of market conditions, um, the House bill would deny commodity payments on those acres, whereas the Senate bill would leave current law in place and allow uh, farmers the freedom to put things in grass rather than in crops. Um, uh, according to the rumor mill, the resolution that they're working on to this issue is going to be the creation of a brand new conservation program specifically targeted to those grass acres in the commodity program uh, to support grassland conservation. It's a, it's a novel, interesting resolution to the issue. Um, amongst other things, it will no doubt put, us, uh, put the U.S. Uh, in uh, jeopardy of more WTO challenges. Um, and then last but not least is the crop insurance title, and there are multiple relevant provisions, but I'll just highlight two. One is on good farming practices. Good farming practices are what um, uh, a determination that needs to be made before an insurance indemnity payment is made, and um, the Senate bill would uh, qualify conservation practices approved by USDA as good farming practices for crop insurance purposes. That provision is not in the House bill, and um, they're working on a resolution to that issue. And then there's also an agricultural data initiative in the Senate bill that would bring conservation um, data from within the department to bear on uh, future uh, risk rating and other crop insurance um, 
propositions to try to to try to bring conservation and risk management policy uh, more in alignment. Then one last thing, and I'll I'll turn it over uh, back over, and that is uh, the raft of environmental policy writers that exist in the House bill, but not the Senate bill. Um, these are not normal farm bill topics. They are brought in from outside the farm bill, but attached um, in the House to the farm bill. And there's there's so many of them I can't list them all, but I'll, I'll name some of the big ones. There's um, a weakening of pesticide law that would prevent local governments from doing any pesticide restriction that was stronger than the federal government's. The House bill would also repeal the clean water rule, which, of course, right now is tied up in litigation anyway, but um, uh, um, that, of course, deals with wetlands and waterways under the Clean Water Act. Um, it, th there's also a provision in the House bill that would um, um, allow the uh, spraying of pesticides directly into waterways without violating the Clean Water Act. There's weakening restrictions on uh, methyl bromide. Um, there's uh, removal of Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries Service um, input into Endangered Species Act uh, uh, decision making. And finally, yeah. last but not least, yeah. there's a, a state and local uh, law preemption in the House bill. So quite a variety of different um, environmental writers. Yeah, and I think that's good to mention because especially now that the House has changed, that uh, that really might change the course of those riders too. So it's, uh, we'll we'll bring that up a little bit later. So Ferd gave us a really uh, comprehensive summary of some of the differences. I was going to ask Alex a little bit about that, but um, maybe just to highlight a few of the things that Ferd just summarized. Alex, would you mind just letting us know what you think some of the major conservation strengths and weaknesses are in each bill? And probably even more importantly, since Fur just covered a lot of that, um, from your perspective, you know, you work with American Forest now, and you've been uh, you've worked with Chesapeake Bay before. What's happening now with No Farm Bill? I mean, that's pretty significant. So, from from the Brown perspective, what's going on without the the dollars that are needed for conservation under the Farm Bill? Sure. Um, thanks, Lori. I think just to pop this up to the sixty thousand foot level for a minute, in terms of uh, the value to conservation of this uh, of the, the conservation title in the farm bill, um, and what what would be really great to see out of this particular bill is this context where what Ferd was talking about is this moving money around, cutting from easement programs, working land programs, this uh, sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul scenario. Um, what we're challenged by right now is the simple fact that there's a lot of limitations on funding, federal funding, um, and yet we have these extraordinarily important programs uh, where we have uh, huge benefits for producers and productivity on their lands, and they're also helping to provide for society um, really improvements in natural resources that translate over to clean air, clean water, stable climate, and sustained wildlife. And so when a farm bill can balance uh, the, the uh, cost effectiveness and, and uh, just the incredible outcomes that can come from investing in lands and in, uh, in these different practices, you know, we really have to understand the value overall, the big picture value that's available to us here. And so what we're looking for from a conservation perspective in this farm bill is this balance and this, this outcomes-driven um, priority investment, kind of very high um, cost-effective uh, uh, you know, uh, operating programs. How can we make these programs really have a, a much higher bang for their buck for conservation so they really prove uh, their necessity and their value to all of us? Um, going forward. So I can just pull out a couple of uh, examples of how uh, these, this uh, is being achieved both in the Senate and the House versions, um, and I think great. much more so in the Senate side. So uh, Ferd mentioned that the Working Lands Programs, uh, EQIP and CSP, um, those are clearly uh, we see improvements uh, in delivery in the Senate version. The Regional Conservation Partnership Program is really uh, upping its game in the Senate version in terms of 
um, making sure that you start to see more uh, measurement of impact and outcome and better targeting of the money to make sure that it's really achieving the conservation outcomes that the program is sort of specially designed to do. Um, and it's also eliminating challenges that participants are facing in administration. So it's combining that uh, cost-effective and I outcomes and impact um, combo deal that's, that increases its value. Um, the same is with the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. There's going to be a lot more um, attention in the Senate version to addressing administrative issues that are really causing problems in places like the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, where the, the program enrollment has gone down because of administrative challenges that are too difficult for stakeholders. So again, increasing the value of the program by making it um, more efficient and effective. Um, one of the things that the Senate version doesn't do is it doesn't address the issues uh, in the landscape scale restoration program related to forests. So that's an area where they had an opportunity. Um, the House version contains needed improvements to that program to make sure that state uh, forest action plans can be, um, can be implemented in the most cost-effective, high-priority um, projects that they have. And that's something that the Senate still hasn't adopted. Um, on the flip side, the House version has, has just skipped over a lot of opportunities to take the measures that the Senate has to make these, uh, these types of improvements. Um, but thankfully, they do at least uh, have the piece for the landscape scale restoration program. I think I can stop there in terms of an overview. Um, yep. Or if you want, I can go into some more, a uh, couple more uh, details on the um, issues caused by the Farm Bill extension. Well, I think it'd be great if you could, yeah, talk about the issues, you know, kind of pivot, just talk about the issues that are sure. arising because they're because we don't have a new Farm Bill. So one of the things that, and I'll just use this as an example, um, program delivery can get really complicated when agencies aren't clear on what the authorities that they actually have are. So when the 2014 bill expired, an example where we have a serious issue in program, program delivery is uh, with the CREP program. So it, this is just a small example of how this things can get jumbled and they happen across the nation in different programs uh, under certain different circumstances. But um, in one situation, uh, we have, and this is nationwide, it's happening. Uh, the Farm Service Agency determined after uh, the farm current Farm Bill expired that they didn't have the authority to pay for the cost incurred under the CRP CREP program by producers. So as an example, um, a farmer and uh, the Farm Service Agency will enter into a contract and the farmer will um, purchase the materials to put in a fence and say the farmer pays $5,000 for those materials. The farmer installs the fence, and for whatever reason, it ends up costing $5,500. Well, normally, uh, FSA would pay out the full $5,500. Now, instead, uh, they've determined they no longer have the authority to pay that additional $500, and so they've actually just shut down the software that's needed to process all of these payments across the country. And so it's these, these administrative hiccups that also come into play during uh, in the appropriations process when there are uh, short-funded um, periods for for ag that we have these these administrative problems that end up falling on the backs of producers and diminishing the trust that, that producers have in these programs that take so much time to develop outreach and and relationships to extend them into communities and so that's really the the untold story and, and negative consequence of waiting and uh, kicking the can down the road on the farm bill. All right, that's an excellent point. Thank you. So, Caroline, uh, Alice is just talking about the value perspective, but you really you have a, a particular perspective that I think is really helpful here. Can you let us know your thoughts from a value perspective, both economic and environmental? What's your overall take on both versions of the conservation title? 
Sure, and first, thanks for having me, um, and thank you both, Kurt and Alex, for your excellent and very thorough explanation of the differences between both bills and the conservation titles. Um, I work at the R Street Institute, so we're a free market think tank dedicated to promoting limited and effective government, and our interest in conservation policy is really to make sure that we get the economics right. So we're constantly looking at ways that we can use market forces to, to address environmental challenges. And when it comes to conservation spending, we really look at it in terms of taxpayers' return on investment. We want to be sure that taxpayer money is invested in the right things that have better environmental outcomes. And we also want to cut spending that's harmful to the environment or that has no positive impact. Um, and in addition to that, we also want to make sure that conservation funding is performance-based and tied to real environmental outcomes. Mm -hmm. So through that lens, I think we believe that the first step to ensuring that conservation programs are having their intended impact and are a worthy investment for taxpayers is to have better information and data related to conservation practices and program implementation. Um, and on the ag data side in particular, there are provisions in both the House and the Senate conservation titles that we're very excited about, which uh, Ferd touched upon earlier in his intro, but I'd just like to briefly highlight again. Um, in the House bill section 2408, it was a FOSO fudge bill. This gives USDA the tools to measure, evaluate, and report on the effects of farm bill conservation programs, and this provides critical support for farmers, taxpayers, and for the environment. Um, and in the Senate bill, section 12504, this was from an initiative being led by Senators Soon and Klobuchar, um, and this would direct USDA to establish a secure data collection system through which USDA can work effectively to utilize data and help understand which conservation practices actually increase producers' profitability and decrease their risk. Um, from a free market perspective, I'm probably less concerned than some of the others about the House's proposal to eliminate CSP, although I'll admit I haven't been as in the weeds on the policy as some of the others have. Um, I don't really care necessarily where it's housed as long as it exists, and I think if we can achieve some programmatic efficiencies here by folding CSP into EQIP, then there could be potential that we can stretch our conservation dollars farther and have better environmental outcomes in the end. Um, a few other things in the Senate bill I'd like to highlight that I think are strong for taxpayers and the environment. Um, the Senate sod saver provi provisions are very smart conservation reforms, which Ferd also touched upon. And finally, um, some of the Senate's reforms to EQIP are very positive, in particular Sherrod Brown's amendment that would increase EQIP payments for conservation practices, which are the most effective at reducing farm pollution. So um, as a free market think tank, there's a lot that we really dislike about the Farm Bill, as you can imagine. Um, but in the conservation title, there really are some promising bipartisan steps toward investing in the right things and ultimately ensuring that our precious conservation dollars are really going where they'll have the most environmental impact. Okay, thank you for that. I think one of the themes of today's call, which I think some people would be surprised about, is how little we don't, how little we know actually about the effectiveness of different practices. And although they're targeted, sometimes they're targeted in such a diffuse way that, that we don't really get the full environmental benefit that we would if we were targeting. So the movement in both versions, I think, to using data and having a more comprehensive program to have that guide policy, I think is really promising and it's long overdue, and I think that's something that uh, all the speakers today really reflected in their comments. So, Caroline, back to you. Could you just give us a brief overview of the current state of the Farm Bill negotiations between the two chambers, and then what really remains the, the major points of disagreement? Yeah, of course. So, as you probably know, both the House and the Senate passed their respective versions of the Farm Bill last summer. Um, and the Farm Bill has been sitting in conference committee negotiations since about August. Um, it technically expired on October 1st, but the real deadline when programs will be impacted is January 1st. So basically we have until the end of this year to see if the conferees can agree upon a bill that would be able to pass both the House and the Senate and ultimately go to the President's desk for a signature. Um, currently, both the House and Senate leadership are insistent that they're very committed to getting a farm bill passed this year in the lame duck, 
but there is definitely still some uncertainty as to whether they can achieve this. Um, for one, there's not a lot of time. There's a lot of other legislative business that needs to be finished this year, um, nominations in the Senate, leadership elections, and other spending bill. So in order to stay on track, basically we're in crunch time right now. Conferees would have to come to an agreement on the key provisions, if not by this week, then by the end of next week. And that timeline would give CBO enough time to score the bill again and then take over the floor before Christmas. Um, so that's obviously a pretty ambitious timeline. And to add to that, there are still some pretty serious disagreements between negotiators. And from what I can tell, there's not really any indication that any of the major points of contention have been resolved. Um, in addition to some of the differences we've pointed out in the conservation title, um, since the beginning, the biggest point of disagreement has actually been over the nutrition title. Um, in the House, Chairman Conaway made work requirements for SNAP recipients kind of the hallmark of his bill. And this is how he was able to pass the Republican-only bill. Um, in the Senate, Chairman Roberts has been very clear from the beginning that work requirements are a non-starter in the Senate. So far, House leadership hasn't backed down on that. Um, so I think at this point, the first hurdle that needs to be overcome is to find some type of agreement on the nutrition title. Um, nobody really knows what that compromise would look like. And then after that's resolved, negotiators will have to turn to the other major areas of contention, like the conservation title and also the commodity title. Um, and if Republicans are not able to come to an agreement and get a farm bill passed this year, the most likely scenario would probably be a one-year extension and it would leave the status quo in place and give uh, the Democrats in the House and the Republican Senate another crack at writing a farm bill next year. So um, okay. overall, passing it's not easy, but Republicans seem committed to getting it done. Right now, I'd put the odds at about 50-50, but I'd be interested to hear what the other panelists have to say. Right. Thank you for that. And because I want to get to the crystal ball portion, which is related to this question, I, I did want to hear Ferd and Alex weigh in. What do you think? Do you, do you think it's possible or more than possible that we would actually get a farm bill this year? Ferd, do you want to start? Sure. I'll give it a, a whirl. Um, I think it is still possible. I think Caroline's exactly right. They need to be done by the time we're all sitting down to turkey dinner next week um, not done in the sense that the bill is you know all the final language is done but all the big deal making is done um, I was I was also at 50 50 until yesterday now I've slipped below 50 <laughs> 50 um, but you know they could rally again today and maybe we'll be back above 50 by the end of the day we'll see it's uh, it's touch and go for sure um, right. the only the only thing I'd add in terms of the big uh, points of disagreement there is besides the commodity issue I already touched on where they do seem to have a resolution on the grass acreage um, the other big debate is mm -hmm. over uh, payment limits where the house bill would basically do away with the notion that there should be any limits, uh, uh, annual limits per farm in terms of the amount of commodity subsidies. And the Senate takes the exact opposite point of view. They would get rid of existing loopholes and, and make the current statutory limit the real limit. And so they're very wide apart on that issue um, still. So that's another biggie to add to the list. Alex, any final words on that point? I, I'm just going to go with possible but not probable. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the House so, leadership has, has recognized that they have uh, slipped in the amount of uh, leverage that they have, um, but they're still working on a highly partisan position, and uh, right. I don't see that changing. Okay, so assuming we don't have a farm bill this year, I'm going to ask you all to look into your crystal balls, and um, now that we've got a really a different, um, a different house, quite a bit different, uh, how has how will those personnel changes impact, if at all, the outlook of passing a farm bill in 2019? Will it be easier, given the differences between the House and Senate bill, or harder, or just the same? So I know this is completely, um, you know, uh, conjecture, but uh, given how the personnel have changed, at least gives us an indication, possibly, where things might go. Alex, you want to give it a shot first? Sure. I, um, you know, back to my 
the last comment that I made around uh, the partisan nature of where we are right now, that's going to change a bit. And with that, it's, we're going to open up possibilities for going into this more, this, the areas of uh, driving towards value, towards uh, high impact um, leveraging of, of federal dollars for outcomes that are important. I mean, these are things that are really values that are shared, um, I think, as it's re reflected on our call here, uh, shared by both parties. And if we can stay in that space, um, we've got a good chance of having a, a, a less partisan um, situation uh, on the Ag Committees next year. So, Ferd, um can you just look at how the players are going to be changing, and can you point out any particular um, uh, members that might make a difference one way or the other? Sure, I could take a shot at that. Um, obviously, uh, Colin Peterson from Minnesota, who's the ranking Democrat now, will become chairman, or is, you know, 99% certain to become chairman. Um, and uh, I think the other significant thing on the Democratic side in the House is that there will, there will be a whole lot of new members of the committee, probably at least seven uh, new members of the committee. That's, that's important, um, and there will be several new members on the Republican side as well, potentially. It, it, it sort of depends what the final ratio is. But um, it, that's important because it just takes time to organize the committee and get people up to speed. Um, and so if we are in a, uh, you know, do-over on the farm bill next year, it, it won't, you know, happen quickly, uh, immediately. But it could happen, you know, faster than maybe some people expect. Uh, you know, I think the most likely, and, and, and the Senate side remains much the same. There, there will be... Um, you know, two departing um, uh, members on the Democratic side, um, but the, the the cast of characters and the basic uh, basic state of play remains pretty much the same over there. Um, I think the most significant thing overall is that when and if they do get to a new House bill under this scenario we're discussing, it will look a whole lot more like the current Senate bill, and once you get to that point, the conference at that point will be far easier than the current conference where you're dealing with a bipartisan bill versus a partisan bill. You'll have, I think, essentially two bipartisan bills in conference at that point. It will make it much easier to reach resolution. It will just take a while to get to, get to that point. Mm -hmm. Before I turn this over to Carolyn, the same question. I just wanted to note for our listeners that we'd love to answer your questions. So if you have any, please type them in. We'll reserve a significant amount of time. We have enough people who want to chat about different issues. Um, okay, having said that, uh, Caroline, what's your take? I pretty much agree with what Bert and Alex have said. I think in 2019 it would be much more of a you know, business as usual farm bill. I think the final product would look a lot like the Senate version does now. I think the Senate version will look pretty much identical to, it does, to how it does now. Um, House is, you know, a little more up in the air, but I think it will be a traditional bipartisan farm bill. Um, and the other personnel change that I think could make a difference and I think would be positive just for the overall um, sake of the political process and ultimate way that the farm bill looks is the rules committee um, changes in leadership. I think this process in the House was extremely disappointing for a lot of us because ultimately almost all of the reform amendments on the other titles beyond just conservation were blocked by Rules Committee. The bill was rushed through without you know, any hearings, no subcommittee markup. So it was a very disappointing process in which a lot of members' voices, in fact, the majority of members' voices were not really heard. Um, so I hope that with that change next year, it would be more of an open process where there would be more opportunity to have different reform ideas considered. Okay, thank you. So here's a, here's a final question. Um, from each of your perspectives, given the versions on the table, what is a best case scenario conservation title? Alex, do you want to start off? Um, well, I, you know, I think what we're what we're sort of circling around here is how um, the Senate 
the Senate version is is quite strong, um, and there's an opportunity to work with that, address some of the missed opportunities from uh, from this Congress, uh, give people a bit more of a time to make sure that things that had been overlooked because of uh, process issues and um, you know get some of the ref other reform concepts in. Um, I think we were mentioning earlier that would be um, that would that would make it the the pain of the wait at least <laughs> a bit better. Right. Thank you, Ferd. Yeah. Uh, conservation title. Yeah, I think you know if we can get a bill this year, um, then it would look much like the Senate bill, probably with some House Conservation Reserve Program uh, tweaks uh, thrown in. Um, and, and, you know, possibly a few other things around the edges, we would hope that it would preserve the House uh, monitoring, evaluation, and assessment of conservation program provisions in the final bill as well. Um, and, and to our way of thinking, that is the best result to get it done, get, get the basic deals done next week, get a bill that looks largely like the bipartisan Senate bill um, into law. Um, that would be best case scenario. Second best case scenario is to, you know, obviously do it again next year. And I think the net, the the end end point result will be much the same as for the conservation title as if they completed it this year. So I don't think it will be all that much different. It'll just take an extra period of time to to get there. Okay, just to follow up, why is it the best case scenario for NSAC that you, we get a farm bill this year? Can you just explain that a little bit? Well, uh, you know, from a conservation title point of view, it's less important. There are other provisions um, in the Farm Bill that um, th there are quite a number of programs that get funded each Farm Bill, um, and um, those programs, if there's no bill um, this year, will likely go without um, funding at least for a year, and then you have to start all over again on those. So, and that that deals with a large swath of agriculture. It's minority farmers, it's beginning farmers, it's organic farmers, it's local and regional food farmers. All of the all of the programs for the, mm -hmm. that swath of farmers um, are would um, disappear um, without um, without either a new farm bill or a, an extension that included funding for a year for those programs. Which has been done before, as we know. Right. So uh, we actually have a couple of questions. Um, Carolyn, did you want to add anything before I move on to the questions? Uh, no, I'm on a similar page. Although in the end, I think best case scenario for us would be an extension. I think it would be it would provide an opportunity for a better process and more reforms beyond mm -hmm. the conservation title. Um, and I think with regards to the conservation title, particularly. Um, it doesn't really risk sacrificing any of the, the progress we've made. In fact, I think it could move the bill in a more, um, in a in a better direction. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point, Lori. If I could okay. just add one thing, this is for sure. One, one one potential benefit from having it go into next year would be to revisit this conservation reserve program issue. I think both bills are making a, you know, from our point of view, a serious mistake in doing a non-market oriented, one size fits all, mm -hmm. uh, sort of lopping off at the kneecap kind of approach. And I think with with extra time, maybe some more thought could be given to that. And move it into a better, better place. Yeah. Um, so here are the two questions. Will Mike Conaway remain on the House Committee next year? Anybody yeah. want to take that? Uh, this is Ferd. Yeah, he he's already said that he intends to remain and remain, uh, you know, become the ranking member. Okay, great. So, any other take on that? Seems pretty pretty clear. Okay, so the other question is, what can we do, if anything, to help get this done, meaning the farm bill this year? It would be a huge waste of time and money to punt this into 2019. So, is there anything our various listeners and other groups that care about conservation can do at this point? The, the grassroots organizer in me wants to say yes, <laughs> but there, <laughs> uh, but it's really down to the final few days. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I I started going below a 50/50 chance yesterday was Chairman Roberts and 
Chairman Conaway had quite a public uh, spat going back and forth yesterday, um, sort of blaming each other for the fact that there's no farm bill. And you, normally, a successful conference gets real quiet before the conference agreement gets made, and this was the opposite. This was very public going after each other, um, which is usually a sign that things aren't going very well. So, uh, you know, when it gets to that stage, it's it's difficult for constituents and outside interest groups to to do very much but you know i think everybody can always weigh in and say get a good bill done and um, from our standpoint a good bill looks very much like the bipartisan senate approach so if you want to add that that would um, at least make one of the two chairmen very happy <laughs> alex and caroline anything to add I agree with No, you. I agree with Ferd. Yep. Pretty much all in agreement on this panel. There's been no sparks flying. Um, so uh, th this isn't uh, in my set list of questions today, but but it really does go to conservation. And one of the uh, and it's touched upon, I think, really with the ag data provision in the Senate, which is a, I think a, a good step moving forward to using data and aligning risk with uh, premium payments, which would be a step forward for crop insurance, um, a, a leap forward. How do you feel, or, or what, do you, what is your take on, in, on the one hand, uh, strong conservation title, but other parts of the farm bill that can actually undercut the investments in the conservation title if policy is not looked at throughout the, throughout the farm bill to actually work together? And this goes to making the far, making our conservation investments as effective as possible. Any any um, thoughts on that? Well, I do have one thought, um, which is you know I'm I'm disappointed at this point that that the, the monitoring and evaluation and conservation effects part of, in the House bill for the conservation title and the ag data piece in the Senate bill that goes more to crop insurance reform are still under negotiation which means they're not they haven't been resolved um and that's really a disappointing sign that that congress is having difficulty saying that um that these kind of uh, you know i think both very important steps forward um are are items that need to be debated at great length they seem so commonsensical that they should have been one of the first agreements reached so that that's that's problematic, and the fact that in the commodity title um, we're we're actually relitigating the Freedom to Farm bill from 1996 and deciding mm -hmm. that well we didn't really mean freedom. You can't <laughs> you can't put land in grass to protect it from erosion or other uh, environmental problems um, and still remain in the program suggests that in some ways we're taking a step backwards. So I do think we still have a long ways to go in terms of integrating conservation throughout the entirety of the Farm Bill and particularly the big um, uh, commodity and crop insurance programs. Titles, yeah. Caroline, this is kind of up your alley. Any thoughts on this too? Any additional thoughts? Yeah, I think um, we absolutely should be having the debate about the crop insurance title and the commodity title and looking at the ways that those subsidy systems kind of incentivize behavior that's bad for the environment, like planning on marginal lands. Um, and because these subsidies really distort the market and encourage farmers to do things that they wouldn't otherwise if they were good stewards of their land, I think that we need to have a full discussion about the way that all the titles impact conservation. Um, and I'm personally really disappointed that we didn't get to have a chance to have much of that debate around the crop insurance and commodity titles this time. Okay, thank you. Alex, Maria, I can any, add, yeah, yeah, I can add a little, uh, another piece here, which is, you know, part of what we're talking about here and circling around is uh, what is the what is the the way that the agencies are relating to and serving producers? Is it uh, as as producers like it as they choose to do things? They uh, they get to just pick from a menu of different programs and operate uh, at, at the way they want to, or 
is there something more um, more focused and more uh, aggressive? And aggressive may not be the right word. Um, maybe ambitious in the way uh -huh. that these programs are run, so that we're really and this is what the outcomes and the and the impact um, concepts are getting at. It's getting at the nature of these agencies and whether they're driving change or whether they're serving producers who come looking for change. And it's and there are pieces getting these pieces that we are seeing now, even just in the conservation title or a little kind of sprinkled throughout this farm bill where we're looking at outcomes and we're looking at impacts and we're looking at measurement. These are baby steps, but they're also challenging the way uh, agency, these agencies are um, have been traditionally historically working with producers and challenging them to consider their role as the, uh, and how they, how, what, what ultimately is their uh, charge in working with producers. Right. And I think, though, that's an interesting perspective. I, I think part of the problem, though, is that the overarching policy has not been, although there's some lip service to it, to really target conservation dollars, and in fact, it's in several of the programs, that it's so disaggregated, and obviously these programs are voluntary, that there isn't that overarching strategic approach which which is fairly incredible given the fact that we've had conservation programs now since the 1985 farm bill so you would think that we would have had a more more strategic and data driven approach by now uh, given given that we're in the year 2018 but we really haven't that might be surprising to a lot of folks but Absolutely. to have these I'm sorry I was agreeing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it's – and it really I, – I think that this is such a, a fundamental issue moving forward, uh, which for me is why in some ways it, it would be good just to get an extension to this farm bill because it, it might give this opportunity to really strengthen and ensure that those two pieces go forward and, and aren't debated. The, but we really need to get a better bang for the public's investment and in the – and just kind of lift up the transparency about what are these dollars doing on the ground, when are they effective, when are they not, and that should really drive um, what Congress does in the next farm bill. Instead, it's it's almost uh, there is some data, but it's just not enough to make really sound policy decisions. We do know, though, that we need conservation dollars, and and these programs are completely oversubscribed. So cutting conservation dollars is the answer. It's really getting data and targeting them and being strategic about how we use the public's investment. I'll get off my soapbox. We're about to wrap <laughs> up soon. Does, are there any uh, other questions from the audience? We'd, we'd love to take your questions. And if there aren't, I just wanted to see if there are any other points that the our, our wonderful panel, they're all experts, and they've been really gracious to take time out from their busy schedules to be with us today. Is there anything else, uh, Caroline, Alex, or Ferd, that you'd like to add? No. Uh, I think we've 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 covered it pretty pretty well. I think. Yeah. All right. So then, my last question for each of the panelists is: In 20 words or less, what are the key takeaways you would like listeners to take away from this webinar today? Why don't we start with you, Ferd? Yeah, I think uh, we could we could get a good bill in the next week if uh, if the House is willing to go most of the way towards the Senate bill, including the conservation title. That would be our number one scenario. Otherwise, we'll be off to 2019 and hopefully get a, an even better bill. Thank you, Alex. I'll just circle back uh, to the conversation we were just having. Um, Conservation really cannot afford business as usual, and we need to make sure that whichever bill passes, uh, that these federal programs are delivering high priority conservation impacts in a really cost effective and efficient manner. Thank you. Caroline? Um, I'll reiterate that you know there are some promising provisions in both the House and the Senate versions of the Farm Bill that would ensure that taxpayers get a better return on their investment for conservation spending, but still lawmakers should go back to the drawing board next year and craft an even better Farm Bill, this time with more comprehensive reform in all of the titles and also with a commitment to bipartisanship. 
Thank you. So I want to thank um, all our panelists today again for being with us and taking time out of their schedules. Their, their expertise is deep and broad, and we really appreciate them being on today. Um, having said that, I think that Brian is going to come back on and just do some final housekeeping matters. And then with that, we're going to conclude. I want to thank all the people in the audience too for joining us today. We really appreciate you listening in today. And um, this, this will be, this has been recorded, and so it can be downloaded and shared beyond today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. As we're closing out the webinar today, uh, you'll see on your screen right now some additional resources. I'd also like to encourage everyone to answer the short survey that will appear when you close out of the event. And please remember that the webinar recording will be available soon. Thank you again for joining us.